In this episode of American Greed, Biggest Cons. New development in our most shocking cases of greed. Tonight, the wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort, the convicted stockbroker who scammed more than $200 million from investors. You think, oh my gosh, this guy must be the worst guy in the world. I had a gift to get, get up before the crowd and sell and manipulate. And I could have used it for good or I could have used it for evil. I used it for evil. I mean, I wouldn't give him my money, but there's something sort of very likable and magnetic about him. Belfer turns his prison time into profit, and his life of sex, drugs, and crime is a cinematic smash. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. That 2013 film made almost $400 million at the box office. But behind the scenes, an ironic twist. In a civil case, federal prosecutors claim the blockbuster movie that made Jordan Belfort famous was financed with stolen money. And now, The Wolf is suing the production company that made the movie. He is biting the hand that fed him. Even when you're telling a story about a huge scandal, the story behind that story could be an even bigger scandal that nobody saw coming. Guys, this is the movie that everyone's been waiting for. The movie and the book it's based on, titled The Wolf of Wall Street. What is it like for you to see your life story play out on the big screen? It's overwhelming, and I, I'm kind of awestruck about the whole thing. From his days as a drug-addled, sex-addicted, sleazy broker to his 22 months serving time for money laundering and securities fraud, to his brief moments in the sun rubbing elbows with A-listers, Jordan Belfort's life has been anything but ordinary. CNBC special correspondent Jane Wells first interviewed Belfort in 2007. Jordan Belfort was a huge admitted scam artist way back over two decades ago in the 1990s. And we're still talking about him now. He has still managed to reinvent himself and stay in the public eye even now. But now, Jordan Belfort is claiming he's the one who's being swindled. In January 2020, his attorneys filed a bombshell $300 million lawsuit against Red Granite Pictures. The production company bought the rights to his autobiography, The Wolf of Wall Street, earning Belfort just over $1 million. They also bought the rights to his follow-up, Catching the Wolf of Wall Street, which could someday become a sequel. When Belfort initially filed this lawsuit, Red Granite's first statement was to call it supremely ironic. Ashley Collins writes about the case for The Hollywood Reporter. This guy went to jail for the events depicted in the movie. It is a little nuts that this guy is suing for $300 million and accusing people of fraud when he himself had been in jail for tricking people out of their money. In his lawsuit, Belfort claims that Red Granite's producers were not legitimately or legally funded when they acquired the lifetime rights to his books. And his claims include fraud, breach of contract, negligent misrepresentation. There's a RICO Act violation thrown in there for good measure. Though a representative for Red Granite has not responded on the record to American Greed Biggest Cons, in April 2020, lawyers for Red Granite filed court papers denying Belfort's accusations, calling his claims as morally bankrupt as he is. Now, the man who made hundreds of millions of dollars on penny stocks by breaking the law is counting on the law to back him up this time. Life is stranger than fiction. He's saying he had no idea that they were tied up in an international crime scandal. And had he known that the movie was funded with dirty money, he never would have gotten involved. And oh, what a scandal it is. Prosecutors claim that from its inception, The Wolf of Wall Street, an asset of Red Granite Pictures, is founded with and fueled by money funneled from the One Malaysia Development Fund, or 1MDB. Set up in 2009 as a state fund to promote foreign investment and partnerships, 1MDB's chairman is Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak. Prosecutors make the following allegations in their civil complaint to justify asset forfeiture. 
They claim that Razak, along with the tight inner circle, used the fund as a front to steal and launder money intended to help the Malaysian people. Razak's circle includes his stepson, Riza Aziz, and a mild-mannered-looking unofficial consultant who calls himself Joe Lo. Razak, Aziz, and Joe Lo have denied all wrongdoing. Lo is the so-called mastermind of this global scandal that involves four and a half billion dollars being stolen from the Malaysian government and funneled into various entities across the globe, including Red Granite. In 2010, Riza Aziz, whose father chairs the 1MDB fund, decides to make his mark on the movie business and launches Red Granite Pictures in West Hollywood. Joe Lo, the consultant from the Malaysian Fund, stays off Red Granite's books, but can help bankroll them as an unofficial backer. The fledgling production company is an unknown, but not for long. With Lowe's expert combination of flattery, VIP swagger, and lavish spending, he soon has Hollywood in the palm of his hand. He came out of nowhere, he was this flash, and he was throwing the money around. FBI Special Agent Gregory Coleman, now retired, has spent years investigating Jordan Belfort and the dubious brokerage firm he founded, Stratton Oakmont. He compares Belfort's crimes to the allegations against Jolo. The characters involved in one MDB case certainly rival some of the characters uh, that, that came up in Stratton Oakmont. The crimes themselves are quite different. Jolo's was uh, a much larger scale. Lowe's spending is so outrageous, he makes Jordan Belfort look like the toy poodle of Wall Street. Earning the nickname the Asian Great Gatsby, Lowe indulges in a bombardier jet, parties with A-list celebrities, he snaps up hotels, mansions, and penthouses from Beverly Hills to Manhattan. According to court filings, he racks up $85 million in Vegas gambling debts and lavish traveling. He's also a patron of fine art. He gifts Picassos and Basquiat to friends, including Leonardo DiCaprio. He even gives DiCaprio movie memorabilia, including Marlon Brando's Oscar for On the Waterfront. After establishing street cred in Hollywood, Red Granite Pictures buys rights to both of Jordan Belfort's books. His first, The Wolf of Wall Street, is the perfect vehicle to launch Red Granite into the stratosphere. Red Granite backs the film with $100 million in financing that prosecutors allege is illegally funneled from the Malaysian fund. One of the things that was really interesting about all of this was sort of a parallel between the fancy parties thrown in the film and this blowout bash that they had at Cannes. With Kanye West and Jamie Foxx headlining the night's entertainment, Red Granite's private party at the 2011 Cannes Film Festival is a luxurious shock and awe display. They're a force to be reckoned with. The whole 1MDB scenario is probably the most ironic thing about this case. People allegedly stole money to make a movie about a guy stealing money, right? It's the ultimate irony. But before the multi-million dollar lawsuits, before the prison time and A-list photo ops, Jordan Belfort is a down-on-his-luck Wall Street wannabe. Fresh from passing his Series 7 exam, 25-year-old Belfort is ready to make his fortune at the prestigious Wall Street firm L.F. Rothschild. In 2007, he tells Jane Wells that his first day on the job is Black Monday, October 19, 1987. That Monday morning, I come in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and the market crashes 508 points on my first day as a stockbroker. Okay, and I'm at, and all of a sudden, everyone's like, it's over. But instead of giving up, he finds another job in Hophog, Long Island. The firm is the investor center a penny stock shop that pushes risky small-time businesses for anywhere from 10 to 99 cents a share. Much to Belfort's surprise, he learns that the brokers make a healthy commission. As the manager explained to me, he's like, listen, your commission is, you get 50% of the bid and the ask. And I'm like, so if someone sends in a quarter million dollars in a trade, I get to keep 125,000? He's like, well, yeah and, and no, it doesn't really work that way in the real world. No one will send that much money in for a penny stock. <laughs> 